So what we're going to look at now is um, we're going to try to do an evangelical assessment of Eastern Orthodoxy. And so this isn't really looking at mission in an Eastern Orthodox majority context, though it can apply towards that. Um, this is really looking at the theology. And we, we saw in the last session a little bit how Eastern Orthodoxy has experienced something of a revival, strangely, in the West. And uh, it's got a particular attraction for evangelicals, I think especially in the United States at the moment. And if I may, I'm going to add a couple more reasons to what we um, saw this morning. Uh, to why there should be this attraction towards um, Eastern Orthodoxy in the West. Um, there's the mysticism of Eastern Orthodoxy seems to be peculiarly attractive to those dissatisfied with Western charismatic experience. I, I give an example of that from um, one of the ex-ministers of the church I used to be at in central London. Um, uh, conservative evangelical church, one of these ministers became a leading figure in the 1960s in the charismatic movement, and then his name was Michael Harper. He then converted to uh, become an Eastern Orthodox priest. Uh, and it seemed that um, his charismatic experience was a, a stepping stone towards um, the mysticism of Eastern Orthodoxy. In the US, even more strongly, it seems to me, there's an appeal in Eastern Orthodoxy towards the rootless evangelicals. There's an appeal of rootedness, tradition, stability, similar to the appeal of Rome, uh, and a beauty, an aesthetic, um, which, which is attractive, an attractive contrast to the banal everydayness of evangelicalism, where there doesn't seem to be any sense of awe or wonder and so, so there's, that seems to be an especially strong attraction in the United States, as I see it. And also, um, slightly more um, humdrum, perhaps, I think some of the converts you see from evangelicalism to Eastern Orthodoxy are fleeing particular Western problems to an unknown that can be molded. So Roman Catholicism is a bit more of a known quantity. Eastern Orthodoxy is a slightly more less defined and slightly less known quantity, and therefore you can flee it into a religion that can be more comfortable according to what you want. Because Eastern Orthodoxy is quite vaguely understood in the West, um, Yotis mentioned that Christian, um, Christianity in the East, Eastern Orthodoxy, has never experienced medieval scholasticism, had a renaissance, uh, a reformation. In fact, in the 1570s, a Lutheran mission team was sent to Constantinople in the hopes of starting a reformation of Eastern Orthodoxy. And the Eastern Orthodox simply didn't understand the categories they were using. They simply didn't understand what they were talking about. Uh, they haven't really had an enlightenment. So Eastern Orthodoxy is important and attractive to the West as well. So it's important, whether you're ministering in an Eastern Orthodox majority context or not, to have some grasp of and appreciation for um, ability to be able to discerningly think about Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, this is a simply massive, massive um, task for however long we've got. And so what I'm going to try to do to give us a good handle on Eastern Orthodoxy to start with, is try to get to those defining strands, absolutely core moments in Eastern Orthodox theology around which other things hang. So Yoss has looked a good bit at ecclesiology, which is core. I'm going to focus on some other issues, key theological issues, so that by having gone to those core doctrinal points, we can then uh, get a good sense of where Eastern Orthodoxy is at and its main concerns. For example, if we were to have but one hour in trying to examine Lutheranism, you want to go in on justification pretty quick. Let's get a good understanding of justification. If you then want to see, well, how is the Reformed tradition different to the Lutheran? Well, you 
certainly want to mention pretty quickly union with Christ. Let, let's talk about that and, and, and see uh, what that's doing to the doctrine of justification. I'm going to suggest there are two main strands to Eastern Orthodox theology that you need to understand to have a fair grasp of it. And the first is to do with icons. Now, why icons? Why is this not a random statement? Well, the first Sunday in Lent is called the Sunday of the Triumph of Orthodoxy um, in the church calendar of Eastern Orthodoxy, which celebrates the veneration of icons. Um, now, it, there's a bit of history here. Uh, iconoclasm had been officially defeated, but then came back in a small way, and then is finally defeated um, under the championship of the Empress Theodosia in uh, Constantinople, and she leads this procession on this day in the year 843, taking icons back into Hagia Sophia. And so the restoration of icons to the churches after the iconoclasts had removed them, this is the triumph of orthodoxy. And therefore, the triumph of orthodoxy is all about the veneration of icons, which gives you a sense of how central icons are to orthodox identity. Um, and, and this then helps you understand some of the um, more popular face of Eastern Orthodoxy, um, priests wearing beards, for instance. It's just, it's an, it's an iconic culture. Um, the priest is um, an icon of Christ, and so Christ had a beard, the priest will have a beard. Um, Constantinople was an icon of the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, the emperor in Constantinople was to be an icon of the heavenly emperor, and so he's surrounded with incredible glory and splendor. Now, the icon controversy was really an extension of the Christological controversy. It was seen as part of the Christological controversy. So of the seven ecumenical councils, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church um, refers to herself as the Church of the Seven Councils. And of those seven councils, the first is Nicaea. And really from Nicaea, they're all really building on Nicaea to define more clearly aspects of contested Christology. So you have the Council of Nicaea, which produces the first version of the Nicene Creed, which then gets developed. Then you have Chalcedon, which is not a creed, it, it provides a definition of the creed, and, and so on. Now, the first six of these councils from Nicaea on, the first six explicitly concern Christology. The seventh council, which is the second council of Nicaea in 787, concerns icons. And so that, and that wasn't considered to be a departure from the Christological topic. It was considered to be really wrapping up still disputed issues about Christology. And so the Second Council of Nicaea, I did say 8787, the Second Council of Nicaea defended the great iconophile theologian John of Damascus. Now, John of Damascus argued the world is iconic in its nature. And to reject icons is to fall into, well, possibly Manichaeism of a sort, which says that um, spirit is good, matter is by nature evil. Or at least if to reject icons is not Manichaean, it is, and here's the central charge, to reject icons is docetic. It is a denial of the true humanity of Christ. Four, John of Damascus in his defense of icons primarily turned to the incarnation as his central defense of icons. In the incarnation, Christ assumed creation, created flesh. 
So God, John said, deified matter. We'll come to, back to this matter of deification in a little moment. So just hold on to that language uh, for now. God deified matter, making matter a vehicle of the spirit. And so the logic goes, if created flesh can bear the spirit and be a vehicle of the spirit and God's revelation, so can created wood and paint. And that wasn't seen to be a strange extrapolation because Christ is the head of creation. All creation must follow him. All creation will be glorified in him, ultimately. And so in Christ, we see God uses created matter, flesh, as a vehicle of his glory. And he can do that in other aspects of his creation, too. Now, that's about where John leaves things in sort of late patristic um, iconology. But the theology of icons then gets developed. And I'm going to move on to Gregory Palamas a little bit later. And a key component in the mature Eastern Orthodox theology of icons is an understanding of the transfiguration of Christ. An understanding of the transfiguration that's most fully developed by Gregory Palamas. Now, Gregory Palamas, for, for you Western theologians, um, his dates were 1296 to 1359. He, is, uh, he was a monk on famous Holy Mount Athos. He was Archbishop of Thessalonica. And he was um, not too far off in time from um, Thomas Aquinas and might be helpful to think of him as a sort of Aquinas of the East. He, he, he has that significance and gravitas for the East uh, and, and is really going to set the theology for the next few hundred years. Now, here's what Palamas does with the transfiguration and why it's important for icons. So think of the transfiguration of Christ where they see his glory and his face shines like the sun, and his clothes are whiter than any uh, laundry could whiten. And what happens is, in the transfiguration, the light of divine glory shines, here's the key bit, from Jesus of Nazareth, human flesh. Divine glory shines through human flesh, created flesh. A divine light shines forth from picturable human flesh. And it is perceived both intellectually and sensibly. So there's an intellectual appreciation of the divine glory of God, and you can actually see it. So the disciples can see it in his flesh. Now, this light of transfiguration would tend to get referred to in the theology by Palamas and others later as the light of Tabor or Tabor, um, the mountain on which the transfiguration um, is supposed to have happened. And this light, the divine light of God's glory, shines through the incarnate Son's created flesh and is perceived then by his disciples, and they then become transformed by that sight of glory. And so this light of Tabor is experienced by the disciples and later can today be experienced by the saints as they are inwardly, initially inwardly, transformed by the perception of Christ and God's glory through Christ. And so a, a key figure here would be to think of Moses too, who, who appears, of course, um, on Tabor. The saints, in perceiving this light of divine glory, are themselves transfigured. Their bodies become transfigured. So Moses in uh, Exodus 33 to 35, Moses spends time with God and 
he begins to radiate, shine with God's glory himself. So what happens is the glory of God shines through created matter, is perceived by disciples, by believers, and they themselves begin to be filled with this divine light and glory, and it spills over in them too. And not only internally transforms them, but begins to, even Yotis um, joked about um, having a glow in the dark here. That's, the idea is that um, some saints, particularly on Mount Athos, go the stories, um, some saints have been transfigured in this life so that they glow, they seem a fire um, with the light of um, God's glory. So, so the, the picture is God's divine glory shines, first of all, <laughs> through the human flesh, the created flesh of the incarnate Son, is perceived then by disciples and believers who themselves receiving this light of Tabor, this divine glory, then themselves pass it on, shine on the light of divine glory. Hence, you can not only see the picturable flesh of Jesus and see divine glory shining through it, wood and paint, other created matter can be vehicles of divine glory and so can saints, so that uh, you could have an icon of Moses or Gregory Palamas himself. Saints who've beheld the divine glory themselves have become glorious, and you can have icons of them, and by beholding a saint, you can receive God's glory. So you could spend time gazing upon an icon of Christ or Mary or Gregory Palamas, and through that, what you're, what you're wanting is to see the uncreated divine light of God's glory. That's what you're wanting to experience. It's this mystical appreciation of God's glory. Now, with Gregory Palamas, it seems to me that the idea of deification in this theology has undergone somewhat of a change. And let me unpack this. In the early church fathers, you see clearly from the second century uh, theologians talking about the idea of deification. But as I read the early church fathers, it seems to me what they mean by deification is something rather different to what Palamas means by deification and what theologians in Eastern Orthodoxy subsequently mean. When you read, say, Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, Athanasius, let's take Athanasius. Athanasius, uh, he believed that the Son becoming incarnate, God becomes man that man might become God. The Son of God becomes man that men might become sons of God. What the Son is bringing to us is his knowledge of the Father. He is in the image of his father because he knows his father. He couldn't image his father if he didn't know his father. And so he's bringing the knowledge of God and bringing us into his own communion with his father. And so deification in the early church seems to me to be something quite akin to what we would call adoption today that saints are united to Christ and brought to share the divine communion. And by sharing the divine communion, the son's communion, knowledge of his father, by doing that, become transformed and glorified. Christ-like, glorious, holy. So th there's, there's quite a relational knowledge based, a, a, a relational um, communion understanding of what deification is here, which, as I say, I, I think can be likened to adoption. With Palamas, though, that's now really shifted. With Palamas, deification means to be filled with the uncreated light. 
So it's not so clearly a relational idea anymore. And we're going to see a little bit more why with an extra bit of his theology in place. This is not really a relational thing. It's receiving the force of divine glory. And um, that, that's important because um, when we talk about deification, it, it seems to me as I read the early church fathers and as I read Palamas and subsequent Orthodox theologians, that, that there's not one doctrine of deification. There's a shifting over time, which is worth noting. And so when you read early church fathers, don't read in a modern Eastern Orthodox understanding of deification. I don't believe they're exactly the same. So that's, that's the first basic strand of Eastern Orthodoxy, the understanding of icons. The second key element of Eastern Orthodox theology that helps you uh, get, a, get a handle on it as a whole is, is the idea of God's incomprehensibility. Now, theologians in the East and West have traditionally and normally believed in the incomprehensibility of God, but they mean rather different things by it. So, Augustine, for instance, absolutely believed in the incomprehensibility of God, but he didn't mean quite what we're going to see uh, later Eastern Orthodox theologians meaning by it. When Augustine talked about the incomprehensibility of God, uh, he meant it more like this. God is intelligible, but my knowledge of him is not comprehensive. So let me try to take an example. I hope this works. So I know Argyrus. Um, my knowledge of him, unless he's been lying to me, even if he's been lying to me, I know some things about me that even just by looking at him. But now Argyrus is a great man. There's much to know about him. But he is finite. So even with Argyrus, I have a true knowledge of him, however much I know him. I have a true knowledge of him, but I don't comprehensively know him. I don't know everything about him. There's loads about Argyrus I don't know. Just as I can see him now, but I can't see every aspect of him right now. Does that make sense? So my knowledge of him is, I have a true knowledge. Uh, my knowledge, he's intelligible to me, but my knowledge is not comprehensive, all-sided. And if that is true of Argyrus, a finite human being, how much more so with God, who is infinite? I, this is Augustine's thinking, I, and, and becomes really standard Western thinking, I do have true knowledge of God through his revelation of himself, but it's not a comprehensive knowledge. I hope to grow in it. But being infinite, my finite mind will never completely know everything about God. I want to keep growing in the knowledge of his infinite riches. But in Eastern Orthodoxy, incomprehensibility means something slightly different. And the great theologian of divine incomprehensibility is the theologian who's known today as Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, he's often called Dennis in the West. Now, while Dennis lived, he, he was um, living and uh, ministering in the late 5th, early 6th century, his works were written as if they were composed by Dionysius the Areopagite, from, who was converted in Acts 17. And so, because it's written as if that guy had written it, his works um, acquired an almost apostolic authority in many circles, both East and West, actually, but particularly in the East. Um, and his writings had simply enormous influence. And Dionysius, or Dennis, really feeds very strongly, he's a real fountainhead, of the Eastern Orthodox tradition of apophatic theology. Um, Yotis mentioned apophatic theology. In the West, it's often known as the via negativa, the way of negation. Um, 
because apophatic theology is about negation, denial. Meaning that when we do apophatic theology, we speak of God in his trans transcendence by saying what he's not. So God is not in time, he does not have a body, he's not sinful, he's not limited, and so on. And that is, in, in, in a pure apophatic theologian's mind, is more accurate than to say what he is. For example, uh, God loves his people. I love my wife. Now, if I simply think my love for my wife, that love is exactly the same as God's love, I'm going to get confused. So apophatic theology is saying you can't simply take the terms of reference we use and project them up onto God. It's dangerous. And in fact, so dangerous is it that every thought we have about God, God is love, holy, righteous, merciful, every thought, because of the difference between us and God, every thought is in fact a deceptive likeness, not a helpful revelation, but because of how different we are. And so, in a sense, you could understand you know, pure apophatic theology as a raging fear of idolatry. Um, if every thought about God that I have is a deceptive likeness, uh, you want to get rid of the idols, so what I do is I, in a sense, fence off my knowledge of God by saying he's not that, he's not that, he's not that. My fear is that you create a God not only beyond words, but beyond the word, and so create for yourself a super idol. There's my fear with this pure apophatic theology. Um, and no language in this understanding is adequate to describe the incomprehensible because God is actually beyond negation as well as affirmation. Um, using language that goes back to Plato, Dionysius would say that God is not only beyond intelligibility, God is literally above essence. He is super essential. Now, What's that going to do to your knowledge of God if that's how you do, if that's your way to do theology? Well, having fenced off what God is not, you haven't yet said what he is. And so what God is has not been defined, and God is left with this theology ultimately in the darkness of unknowing. And this in Eastern Orthodox circles, it is argued, is just how God has revealed himself. So at Sinai, the Lord is hidden in thick cloud and darkness. And that's not a point about the law, it's about how God reveals himself. Oh. That God is actually hidden in his revelation. Now, with those two things in mind, so the icons, we want to see the light of divine glory, this light of Tabor, and God is unknowable and absolutely hidden in darkness. Are you seeing a tension here? We've got a big dilemma here. How do you see the unseeable? If, if the goal is to see the uncreated light of divine glory, but God is completely unknowable, <laughs> what, what do we do with that tension? And Gregory Palamas came up with an answer. He developed a distinction between the essence of God and the energies of God. Now, uh, and this is characteristic of um, Eastern Orthodox theology, Palamas in making this distinction was absolutely critical in founding the shape of Eastern Orthodoxy. Now the essence of God, God in his being is utterly unknowable, utterly incommunicable. So God reveals himself in his energies. Now, what are these energies? In a sense, you could say this is God in himself, God in his essence, and God as he works outwardly, God ad extra. But, but these energies, they are the uncreated glory of God. This is not a created thing. 
So you have the essence and the uncreated energies of God. Um, the workings, the operations of God. And these energies are inseparable from the essence of God, but they are distinct. Because the, the essence of God, remember, is utterly incomprehensible. But we will perceive the energies of God. Now, you could, in the West, you might think, that sounds a bit like how God is in himself, and then you've got grace. So God, who God is in eternity, and then how he relates to us, sort of economic and imminent trinity stuff. You could be thinking of that sort of term. It wouldn't quite be accurate, actually. It would be a slightly distorted understanding. Vladimir Losky says this. Uh, Losky says, the energy is not a divine function which exists on account of creatures. That would be our understanding of grace, wouldn't it? God is gracious towards creatures. But he's saying, no, no, that's not how it works. Listen to this. Even if creatures did not exist, God would nonetheless manifest himself beyond his essence. Just as the rays of the sun would shine out from the solar disk, whether or not there were any beings capable of receiving their light. So, this is not like grace. These energies are not a kindness of God as such. God just emanates out. This is not a personal communication here. Now, I'm hoping then that having seen those two key strands, icons and God's incomprehensibility, and seeing how Palamas is trying to hold that together with the energy's essence distinction, I'm hoping we've then got a good handle on some of the essence of, uh, that's not meant to be a pun, of Eastern Orthodox theology. So, how are we then to assess this? What are we to make of this? Well, with the icons, I think one of the first places to go, uh, most popularly evangelicals would go, is they'd say, isn't there going to be a confusion between the veneration of icons and adoration or worship? And I, th I think that's a, a legitimate um, challenge and worry. Um, we do need to respect that distinction, to be fair, a distinction between veneration and adoration, um, though it might get confused popularly. Um, I've got um, one of my staff, um, Bob Lethem. He, he told me about a time that he went round to um, a conservative household, um, very much of the Reformed tradition, and there in the living room by the piano, framed nicely, was a picture of the doctor, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And Bob Lethem was saying, now, they were venerating that. There was a real respect for Lloyd-Jones there. It absolutely was not worship, but, but there was a real respect there. So we, we, need to res we need to understand there is the possibility to make a distinction, <coughs> even though that distinction might actually collapse in practice. But where theologians, I think, should go is, is a little bit deeper into some of the more core issues. And some Western theologians have wanted to ask this. This distinction between essence and energies, does this mean there are two parts to God? And can you divide God up in this way? And there, there seem to be some important problems some fallout here if you do. For instance, what does that mean about the incarnation? Can the Son really become incarnate if God is incommunicable? Now, what Palamas could say is, well, God's energies have become incarnate, because God's essence is absolutely incommunicable. But if you say that, if you went for that solution, Athanasius would have you in a heartbeat. Because Nicaea was all about defending that the Son, the one who becomes incarnate, is of the same being, being, essence of the Father. It is the one who's of the very being of God, of the Father, who becomes incarnate. It is not merely the energies of God that becomes incarnate. It is the essence of God. So God has communicated his very being in the incarnation. So there seems 
to Western theologians to be um, a problem here with the incarnation by having these two parts in God. The next question would be, how can we know the unknowable God? With such a sharp discrepancy between the knowable energies and the unknowable essence of God, can we actually know God? And we're left without confidence in our knowledge of or our standing before God. And uh, Donald Fairburn at Cordon Conwell has pointed out uh, the constant refrain that you get in Orthodox liturgy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. The, the repetition of it is actually suggesting a lack of real confidence in that mercy because God is unknowable. You don't know if he is going to have mercy or has had mercy. And so Eastern Orthodoxy with this radical understanding of God's incomprehensibility leaves you with a mystical contemplation that I suggest is ultimately agnostic. It is not a faith that can seek understanding. And this is, as I see it, a departure from what Athanasius fought for um, against Arius. Athanasius taught that because the word is truly God and becomes flesh, that means there is a true revelation of God in the incarnation. And Athanasius said that to distinguish himself from Arius. So Arius was saying, the son who becomes flesh is not truly God, but what does that mean for revelation? If the Son is not truly God, you've not got a real revelation of God in the incarnation. But this seems to be exactly where Eastern Orthodoxy is taking you, to similar conclusions as Arianism. Uh, please hear me, I'm not suggesting Eastern Orthodoxy is Arian. It's got there through a slightly different route, but it's left you with a similar problem. From there, let, let me turn to just uh, quickly a couple of other um, issues quite quickly um, that we haven't had time to address. The first I've put, I've put in authority, scripture, and tradition. Now that is such a Western thing to have written. Any um, Eastern Orthodox guy would say, first of all, authority, what a Western concern, and scripture and tradition, what a Western way of phrasing it. Because, but, but a Protestant is concerned with these things. Eastern Orthodoxy doesn't really seem um, to be especially concerned with questions of authority. It thinks more of a spiritual stream of life and grace, um, of which both scripture and tradition are a part. So Basil the Great said, we do not content ourselves with what was reported in Acts and in the epistles and the gospels, but both before and after reading them, we add other doctrines received from oral teaching and carrying much weight in the mystery. Now it's worth saying, Eastern Orthodox theologians <coughs> speak with different emphases about the role of scripture and its relationship to tradition. So there's not quite one voice here, but here's what does unite them. None have scripture as a supreme authority, trumping all others. And I should just say, when the Eastern Orthodox say scripture, for, for the Old Testament, they mean the Septuagint, the Alexandrian canon, um, meaning in, including the Apocrypha, though sometimes as sort of second class scripture. And so Protestants see the same problem here that they would see in Roman Catholicism, um, that it is not the church that produced the Bible, the church is the creature of the word of God. Scripture is supreme and creative, and no word of man ever has the same authority as scripture. Move on from revelation to soteriology. Sorry, I'm having to move quite fast here if I'm to try to give some sense of some of these other things as well. Soteriology. Now, do you remember the Orthodox Church likes to refer to herself as the church of the seven councils. Um, 
And we've seen the importance of the Second Council of Nicaea concerning icons. But there was a church council at the same time, uh, in the same sort of time frame, that the Orthodox don't recognize. Uh, it's not surprising they don't, because it happened in the West. It was the Council of Carthage in AD 418. Now, it's not surprising the Orthodox don't recognize it, but it is significant that they don't, because the Council of Carthage was the council that rejected Pelagianism. And in the East, not having been troubled by Pelagius so directly, questions of sin, grace, free will were not so prominent. And thus, in the West, theologians were more prone to consider justification, grace, the human will, much more than they ever were in the East. And then that maps out into quite a different understanding of what salvation is. So first of all, let's start with a human problem. In Eastern Orthodoxy, there is, again, there are different positions, but there is generally a considerably weaker view of the fall. Um, the idea of total depravity is absent. The idea of original guilt is almost universally absent. Uh, rather, you become guilty by doing bad things. Now, with this weak, hear me carefully here, this weaker view of the fall, this then affects, if you have a, a lesser problem, the solution's going to be lesser. Um, it's going to look different. And so the incarnation, redemption, in Eastern Orthodoxy, because of the problem is different, the incarnation is not so much about salvation from sin as about deification. So the emphasis is on the coming of God to men, the conquest of death and the resurrection, it's not atonement for sin at the cross because sin is not the problem we're seeking to really deal with. And so you, you might say in different theologies, you can have systems where there are two act, two act stories and three act or three act schemes of salvation. In the, we're in the West most used to a three-act scheme. So a three-act scheme is you have creation, fall, redemption, right? Three, three acts. You have creation, fall, redemption. Now, Eastern Orthodoxy is a bit more of a two-act show. You have creation and then deification. There's not such a big deal about the fall in the middle. It's there, but it's not such a prominent feature. And I suggest this is actually precisely the difference, in that we have a Cyril scholar in the room, this is precisely the difference between Cyril of Alexandria and Nestorius. So Nestorius believed very much in this two-act scheme of salvation, that you have the first age of corruption, and then you have a second age of incorruption, and, we, and Jesus lifts us from one into the other. That's your scheme of salvation. Whereas Cyril, fighting for the Orthodox, was wanted to say, no, 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 no. Rather than um, Christ coming as an exemplar to lead us into the second age, rather you have God comes in the flesh as an entirely sufficient savior. In him is salvation. And so rather than leading us into a second age, he accomplishes salvation in himself. And this leads to final little observation, the issue of synergism, synergistic um, soteriology in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, as in, it, salvation is a cooperative thing, a cooperation between God and man. Now, this synergism seems to me to be a departure from, not a faithfulness to, Cyrillian Orthodoxy. Cyril's saying God's redemption is sufficient, he's not an exemplar. And if that's right, that synergism is a departure from that orthodoxy, then 
Eastern Orthodoxy has departed from patristic orthodoxy. And those who are not synergistic have actually maintained faithfulness to patristic orthodoxy. But synergism seems to be, in Eastern Orthodoxy, of a piece with a failure to see the complete sufficiency of Christ for salvation, which gets displayed in prayers to the saints and especially Mary. And those prayers often seem to slide into the belief that Mary and the saints are not just intercessory friends, they're mediators. And so once again, you have a, a detraction from the complete sufficiency of Christ as a savior.